Thank you so much, uh, Zenia, Jon, and Nondiek for uh, for your presentation and uh, your uh, yeah inspiring uh, speech. Um, let me please also uh, then follow up uh, with uh, with our second session. We are only ten minutes out of time, so we're doing quite well. Um, so let me uh, introduce to you uh, Mr. Herman Snell. Uh, he is a Rural Innovation li uh, Livelihoods Advisor at Wageningen Center for Development Innovation, uh, Wageningen University and Research. Uh, Hermann has over 15 years of international experience uh, working in the field of agriculture development and food systems transitions. Uh, and uh, uh, he has actually worked and also lived in uh, Africa, where he has supported initiatives focusing on sustainable development, ag inclusive ag uh, agribusiness, but also sector transformation. Uh, Herman uh, himself uh, also worked in Kenya, Ethiopia, South Africa, Ecuador, so a lot of countries actually, and uh, trying to bring together a variety of stakeholders to design and implement integrated development initiatives. Today, uh, during this session, we are uh, focusing on uh, Kenya. Uh, Herman is going to uh, present his uh, food studies uh, there. Herman, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Diana, for that nice introduction. Uh, nice to virtually see and meet everybody. Thank you all for joining. My name is Herman Snell, as was mentioned and I work for Wageningen Center for Development Innovation. I'm going to start sharing my screen so that I can uh, uh, share with you uh, an overview of a study uh, that we uh, uh, briefly have, have actually just finalized. The study was commissioned by the, the, the Dutch embassy in Kenya. And the study uh, was looking into the Kenyan poultry sector using a food system lens. Uh, and then also using that food systems lens to assess uh, the amount and, and, and the necessity to reduce food losses in the poultry supply chain. Um, uh, in this study, I must actually mention as a disclaimer, we also looked at two other uh, food products. We also looked into avocado and, and mango, but evidently for the purpose of this session, I'll be focusing on the, the poultry supply chain. Um, we did this study also uh, with a number of, of, of participating uh, and collaborating consultants, which you see also on the right hand side of the bottom right of the screen, Lattice Consulting and Lariva International with whom we formed a consortium to perform the study. So in essence, uh, as I mentioned before, what we did was use a food system lens or rather the food systems framework to look at food losses within the Kenyan poultry sector. And the main questions that we asked ourselves, what, what are the main drivers and causes of food loss in the poultry sector? What are the critical points in the supply chain where these losses occur so that we know how and where to act on? And uh, a, a key question that we asked ourselves, so what is the relation of these food losses to uh, with regards to food system outcomes. And I'll, I'll, I'll definitely delve deeper into these questions throughout the presentation. But uh, as I learned in the previous presentation, I, I have to make the clear message in the first three minutes. So in essence, what our study was focusing on was to understand how loss reduction can positively affect food system outcomes but also how can loss reduction positively affect sustainable development goals? And on the top uh, right corner, I've posted a number of sustainable development goals that I believe can definitely be positively affected by reducing the losses in the Kenyan poultry sector. I'll not go into them one by one in this particular slide, but I will go into them a little bit more in detail in a further slide. Uh, so perhaps I, I thought it might be uh, valuable to start off with a very, very brief short definition. So what is this food loss and waste that we're looking at and why, what is food loss and what is food waste? So I won't bore you with any conceptual definitions and I'm really going to keep this very short. For the purpose of our research and our analysis, we considered food loss, those food products that have reached full maturity 
but do not reach the end consumer because they are lost somewhere between the farm gate and the end consumer. <clears throat> and then uh, in contrast, food waste are those food products that have reached the end consumer, but in the end are not consumed because they are wasted at that level. Now for the case of Africa and for that sake for Latin America and Asia as well, the largest majority of losses are literally food loss. Uh, that is contrary to the case of Europe, North America, where the largest volumes are loss uh, are occurring at the consumer side. So we have definitely predominantly looked at the losses from the farm gate up to the point where the end consumer purchases the product, in this case, the poultry product. What I wanted to do with this slide is also provide a brief overview. So now we've been hearing a lot about these food systems and everybody's talking about food system transitions, food system transformation, but what are these food systems and how, how are they different from the ways that we have been looking at food uh, agriculture in the past? So what I have, what I, in this slide, what I'm showing is, is the Van Berkham food system model, which is a food system framework that has been developed by Wageningen University and research. Uh, and I'll use this because I find it particularly insightful and structured. There are many different food systems frameworks, but for the purpose of this assignment and this research, we looked at this one. So in essence, uh, what a food systems perspective or approach does is see uh, food uh, in its complexity and in its uh, integrated perspective from production up to consumption, uh, but also all the stakeholders, all the actors and factors that are affecting food. So what you see, if, for instance, at the bottom are the environmental drivers that affect food, and you'll see a numerous amount of, of I'm not going to read them all, uh, of drivers that affect a food system. At the top, you see the socioeconomic drivers that affect food systems, markets, policies, science, technology, et cetera. And in the core left center, in blue, you see food system activities. And even in that center, you'll see some uh, uh, like a chain, in essence, from production to consumption, which is coined food supply system. Now, in essence, what you see in that food supply system, many of you will recognize is a traditional conventional value chain or supply chain. So what I want to highlight by this with this slide is that a food system goes a bit beyond the traditional value chain or supply chain analysis, looking into other aspects of environmental, socioeconomic, uh, enabling business consumer characteristics that affect and influence the food system. Moreover, and perhaps most importantly, what a food system approach does is to look and focus on the right-hand side of this framework of this figure, which are the food system outcomes. So how does production, how does a particular food system, a supply system affect food system outcomes? And we look at three food system, different type of food system outcomes, socioeconomic outcomes. So this is income, livelihoods, employment generation. How does the food system cater for those outcomes? Um, Secondly, we look at food and nutrition security. And what we focus on at that level of outcome is how does the food system contribute to food utilization, food access, food availability? And uh, in other terms, I think we should also add here food security. So thinking also about the, the, the security and not only the nutritious value, but also the safety and security of food. Lastly, uh, but not least, within the food system outcomes, the third level that we look at is the environmental outcomes. So this relates to the impact that a food system has on the environment and the efficiency of resource utilization. Now, why I coined these as being very, very important factors of uh, and, and differentiating factors that, that, that have come into play when using a food system perspective is that in the past, 
the outcomes that we were primarily looking at have been production and productivity. Your success is, is, is calculated by how much yield you have and how productive you are. What we are now trying to transform or trying to move towards is to include other types of indicators that also give an indication of the health and let's say the, the, the social value of a food system. And these are the indicators that I've just coined. So social economic outcomes, the food and nutrition security outcomes and the environmental outcomes. Okay, without going into too much detail, I just wanted to frame this because this is the particular lens, the particular goggles that we used to look at the Kenyan poultry sector. And in particular, our assignment from the embassy was to look at how are food losses taking place and what options are there for storage, agro-logistics and agro-processing to reduce losses and improve the poultry sector with a particular focus as mentioned on the food system outcomes. For our research, uh, we use different approaches and different methods. Uh, uh, aside from a, a robust literature review, we also engaged with a, a, a large variety of uh, key informants and stakeholders, both in Kenya and the Netherlands. And uh, we did both interviews and group discussions with these stakeholders. We looked into both public uh, uh, stakeholders, private stakeholders from the business sector, uh, knowledge institutes and civil society organizations. And at times we even brought these stakeholders together to validate some of the findings uh, of our report. Uh, and then uh, as a result, we, ha we, 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 we set up a sort of a rapid sector analysis. We ha uh, have uh, created what we call a poultry loss profile. I'll show this to you uh, briefly. And we have identified critical leverage points. And what I refer to with leverage points, this is also very much a food system, system, uh, let's say language, this leverage points are points within the system where a small or a brief intervention change, uh, 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 supportive policy can actually make huge contributions uh, and, and positive change to the entire system. So we have identified a number of critical points within this food system where we feel that an intervention can actually bring very positive results. So maybe that was the backdrop of how we've uh, uh, set up the study, our methodology and the particular lens uh, that we're using to look at the Kenyan poultry sector. Uh, let me start off just now by presenting a couple of insights from our study, and I'm again going to aggregate first looking into the Kenyan food system as a whole. So in, in Kenya, the agri food system contributes to 34% of the total national GDP. Yeah, so it's a significant contribution to the national economy is set by the agri food system. Uh, moreover, the agri-food system is largely informal, and uh, as such, it generates more than 80% of employment opportunities in Kenya, and this is a statistics from the Kenyan National Bureau of Statistics. Uh, so 80% of the Kenyan, let's say, employable population is directly or indirectly uh, involved in agriculture or agri-food related activities and derives a part of their livelihood from that. Huge significant amounts. Now, this is definitely not only poultry related, but in general for agriculture. Uh, what we also see is that micro and small sized farmers account for the largest proportion of agricultural producers and uh, in, 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 as a result, also the largest volume of agricultural produ produce. Uh, for Kenya at the moment, we have not been able to find a national poultry sector strategy. And again, thinking of our, the focus of our study to look at food loss and waste, there is also no Kenyan food loss and waste reduction strategy at the moment. Nevertheless, as Kenya is a signatory of the Sustainable Development Goals, implicitly, they have also set up targets within the Sustainable Development Goals to reduce food loss and waste. 
uh, as signatory of the Malibu Declaration, there is also a specific mention of reducing food loss and waste. And very recently, Kenya has launched their national sustainable waste management policy, which is actually pushing private sector industries and companies towards a more responsible management of their waste products, including food loss and food waste. Uh, now, as mentioned, there's huge amounts of people involved in the Kenyan agricultural sector and the, the Kenyan agricultural sector transformation and growth strategy states that millions of Kenyan households depend on agriculture for income and food security. Therefore, this country's social stability and economic growth depends on enabling these people to contribute to the economy and offering them better food security. So again, what Kenya is focusing on in this particular statement is we should support smallholder agriculture, uh, people, smallholders that are involved in agriculture because they are the backbone of our economy, of our food and nutrition strategy, and their livelihoods depends on this activity. Uh, as, uh, as you know, and this is the case for many African uh, countries, also in Kenya, we see huge population growth. Uh, uh, demography is changing. People are moving towards more urban settings. Uh, middle class is growing. And with all of these dynamics, we also see changing diets. For the poultry sector, this is incredibly interesting because a larger amount of consumers are, have the resources available to purchase poultry meat or to invest in poultry production uh, in order to engage in this sector. Uh, what we also see is that there is a growing amount of consumer demand for poultry in Kenya. Uh, and this stems not only for, uh, from, let's say, the dietary preference towards poultry meat, which is growing uh, more and more, but also uh, because poultry meat is considered highly nutritious and is culturally very relevant for certain social events. Uh, what we also see in Kenya is that although there is not a national poultry sector strategy, there is huge focus on inclusive agricultural sector transformation uh, that is supported by a number of policies and a number of strategies, both at a national level and at a county level. And most of these strategies in the past have had a strong focus on production and productivity. So increasing production, increased use of agricultural inputs, increased mechanization, these type of, of aspects. But what we see now uh, is that these strategies and policies are increasingly focusing on value addition and processing. And once again, uh, for the Kenyan poultry sector, we see that this is a very supportive enabling environment for the types of uh, initiatives and interventions that could possibly take the poultry sector to a next level. Uh, and additionally, uh, I, I do not want to neglect the fact that many of the Kenyan uh, agricultural policies are definitely focusing on smallholder farmer, uh, employment generation and income generation. Now, uh, another characteristic of the Kenyan food system is that there is not just one food system. There are actually a, a, a number of food system typologies, I'd like to call them. And I'd like to just for the purpose of, of this presentation, summarize and, and aggregate many of these typologies into two mainstream. So first on the left, we have the rural and traditional informal expanding food supply system. So this is a subsistence-based uh, production system uh, where people grow uh, pulses, grains, perhaps some fruits and vegetables, primarily intended for self-consumption and a small part of, of uh, surplus intended for the market. In this case, we also have often that there is one or maybe two uh, uh, agricultural products that are a cash crop or a daily source of income. Uh, this is the most common type of food system in Kenya. It involves the largest number of people. Uh, it produces the largest volume of food products also for the poultry case. It in, uh, incurs in essence also the largest volumes of loss. And this is the type of food system that is primarily supplying the domestic market. 
Now, in contrast, on the right-hand side, you'll see another type of food system which has been identified as the emerging and diversifying food supply system. So this is a, a food production system in which uh, increasingly agricultural inputs are being used, which is increasingly oriented towards market, uh, uh, which is increasingly oriented towards commercial crops. Uh, and even though it is not very common yet in Kenya, in, in comparison to the other rural traditional food system, it is growing in number uh, uh, and it is growing in, let's say, uh, uh, in, in the amount of hectares that it is covering in Kenya. In Kenya. Uh, nonetheless, it involves less people uh, and it generates employment for reduced numbers of people. It produces at this stage in time smaller volumes of, of, of food because of the vast amounts of, of smallholders are in contrast. So smaller volumes of food, nevertheless, much higher quality food products. Yes. Um, uh, in general, these type of food production systems tend to already invest a lot in loss reduction measures because they, they cater for high quality, high value food products. Uh, so we see lower volumes of loss occurring here. And as you can imagine, these type of food systems primarily are supplying the export market and the high end domestic consumers. The same goes for poultry. We see definitely a, a very large amount of rural traditional uh, poultry producers which have indigenous poultry in their backyard and they supply the domestic informal market. And we see a very small number of uh, let's say larger industrial based poultry companies um, that produce high quality poultry products and supply uh, the high end domestic market. Not so much the export market as there is very little poultry product in Kenya at the moment that is being exported. So in this slide in the, with the red dots, you see some of the critical points that we have highlighted uh, where um, uh, which affect food losses in the poultry supply chain. Uh, the market, which is, uh, let's say, uh, uh, very difficult to reach for smallholders with small amounts of chicken per, per, per smallholder. So they use aggregation networks through uh, marketing agents, informal marketing agents that then aggregate at the village level and transport to a wholesaler or a retailer. Um, as mentioned, at currently there are no, let's say, incentives or policies uh, specifically targeting the, pol the poultry sector, although there are a number of projects uh, and uh, both uh, public and, and NGO uh, bilateral projects focusing the poultry sector. Uh, another element that is definitely affecting losses in the poultry sector is uh, the transport networks, which in Kenya, at least at the rural countryside, make it hard for poultry products to uh, enter the Nairobi market, especially seen as uh, at least the largest volumes of poultry uh, of, of, of animals are transported live from uh, the farm to a distribution center or to a wholesale market. As mentioned, there are currently no regulations in place uh, with regards to the poultry sector. So no regulations on production, no regulations on food security, uh, bio uh, security. There are currently little regulations, if none, uh, in terms of how and, and norms and regulations on how to transport your animals, et cetera, et cetera. So there is uh, not so much of, of a control. Uh, I must uh, have a footnote there in terms of the, the industry players, the handful of large scale industry players, they cater for uh, the hospitality sector, supermarkets, and they indeed in the, do have a stronger regulations uh, in place in terms of food safety, biosecurity, etc. Um, so moving to the food supply system here, the mid part of this graph, you see where we see the three main points where losses are taking place are in storage, uh, 
in processing and transformation, there's not so much losses taking place, but there's huge opportunities from our perspective there in order to, uh, let's say, reduce losses by processing and transforming uh, uh, live birds into uh, ready-made and perhaps frozen food products. Nevertheless, uh, the great question is, is the Kenyan consumer, is the market, is the demand there? Uh, so that is the, the last point here, which is food consumption and retail and provisioning. Um, there are strong cultural preferences towards uh, indigenous chicken, towards, uh, uh, let's say, live birds. And I'll touch on this a little bit long uh, later in this presentation. So in terms of business services, why we've coined these two uh, elements here that are affecting losses. There is a lot of technologies out there that can reduce losses. Nevertheless, smallholder farmers find it hard to access market and therefore are unwilling at this moment and stage to actually invest in poultry production. And there are very, very little uh, agri-finance providers that will not just invest in poultry production, but invest in transporting, in processing, in agro-logistics and agro uh, uh, and, and, and let's say post uh, value addition, right? So I, I think uh, these are elements uh, which are important to take to account, into account and they'll come back in our conclusions and recommendations, which I'll share with you briefly. Uh, so now really looking into how the food losses in the poultry sector affect the food system outcomes. Again, remember we're talking about socioeconomic outcomes, the income and livelihoods. So evidently the losses, uh, which are significant in the indigenous poultry sector, uh, particularly in transport, affect income and livelihoods of producers and supply chain st stakeholders by reducing their income. Uh, also the availability and affordability of poultry products are reduced by the losses. This is no rocket science evidently. And the, the resources utilized, so land, water, labor, and the investments of inputs that are related, uh, that are, let's say, that, that have been used to produce these poultry products, which are in the end not consumed and not purchased, are obviously also lost. So this is also uh, related to inefficient utilization of resources. Now, with to go beyond just looking about the negative impact of losses on food system outcomes i'd like to also say that if we're able to reduce the losses there are opportunities to generate employment and income through service provision and processing uh, there is also the opportunity to improve evidently the availability and affordability of safe and nutrition dense foods and we can have a strong option and, and, and possibility to improve the resource use efficiency within the poultry sector, which evidently will have strong impact also on the business case and the return on investments in this sector. And that is a key point. If people would like to invest in loss reduction, there needs to be a clear business case behind that. And uh, it's important for smallholders to understand this business case uh, in order to actually start investing in the sector. Okay, so I was talking about uh, how uh, reduction in losses then can actually positively affect the food system outcomes. But as I mentioned before in my presentation, I also think that food loss reduction can positively affect sustainable development goals. And I'm talking in particular about a sustainable development goal focusing on no poverty, number one, the zero hunger, number two, I believe that a reduction in losses can also uh, 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 provide decent work and economic growth for many rural uh, stakeholders. It can reduce inequalities. It can improve responsible consumption and production. It can uh, have positive impact on climate action through the more efficient utilization of resources. But what is very strongly required is strong partnerships for the goal. So 
we cannot believe that smallholders are the ones that need to invest. I think that uh, more public private partnerships are required, uh, bringing together different stakeholders within the sector, including the industry, including the private sector, including the marketing agents and uh, the county level governments to invest not only in innovation, and infrastructure, but also into, um, let's say, uh, sector sector integration uh, 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 as a whole. Uh, let me just skip into this one. I just wanted to come back to the Kenyan poultry sector and actually coin some very important statistics, uh, really focusing on that Kenyan poultry sector. So 65% of Kenyan households raise poultry. Uh, the majority, as I've mentioned on a couple of occasions, are indigenous chicken producers. There are approximately 39 million poultry units in Kenya, of which uh, the majority are indigenous chickens, but how many people are actually involved in the different, uh, let's say, poultry sectors in Kenya? So what we have been able to find out is there's approximately 20.6 million Kenyans that keep free range poultry, which is referred to as the indigenous chicken, right? Then there's 3.4 million, so significantly less uh, people that live in households who are involved in semi-intensive poultry farming. And there's less than 100,000 people in households that are involved in intensive broiler production. So this was the case in 2018. We're well aware that things are predominant that might be changing and that there will be an increase in intensive broiler production. But nevertheless, I think it, it, the figures speak for itself. The largest amount of households uh, that are involved in the poultry sector are these small scale farming households that have uh, free range poultry often in their background, back, backyard, sorry. Uh, um, what we've also been able to find out is that approximately 85% of the entire Ken Kenyan poultry flock is sold live at the domestic market, right? So uh, both urban and rural, uh, and they're transported live. Um, only 10 to 15% of birds uh, at this moment are sold slaughtered and perhaps in other states slaughtered and frozen, uh, packaged, et cetera, et cetera. So, once again, the largest amount of volumes are sold live in the domestic market. Uh, at this moment, uh, the poultry sector suffers from a lack of market information, particularly this informal part of the sector, right? The indigenous chickens. Uh, there's a hardly market information. There's a lack of transparency. There's a lack of biosecurity and vet veterinary controls and the lack of traceability in this informal chains. Uh, this is quite the contrary for the formal industrial sector, right? Where there's a very much uh, control and biosecurity in place. Uh, in uh, there's only a small number of poultry farmers that are actually formally organized into producer organizations in Kenya and that have contractual arrangements with industry processors. This is growing as the sector is evolving, but currently it is a very limited number. There's, uh, as have been mentioned, only a handful of large scale industrial companies and uh, most producers market their birds through marketing agents. So the, the connection between the farm gate and the market is often a marketing agent. Um, and a growing critical mass of consumers uh, in Kenya that has the financial resources to purchase at supermarkets and are actually actively searching for safe, traceable, processed and packaged chicken products. Um, so in terms of, consumption of poultry products in Kenya. Nairobi's consumption is estimated at around 5 million birds per day, and it continues to grow. Uh, as have, I have mentioned, the Kenyan consumers have a preference for indigenous birds. Uh, the price of these indigenous birds is actually usually higher. There's a larger demand for live birds, which corresponds to the belief that fresh meat is healthier uh, than slaughtered meat. And a very important figure is the current food protein availability in Kenya is estimated at 60 grams per day, and only 25% of this is of animal origin. So again, huge potential for the Kenyan poultry sector to cover this gap 
and provide uh, affordable, healthy, and safe poultry products to the domestic consumer. Uh, as have, I have mentioned, a large amount of rural households keep poultry, and in some counties, it's actually almost 95-96%. Uh, it contributes to household income, food and nutrition security. Some households derive approximately 50% of their income from poultry production. And remember, this is a weekly supply of income. They can sell birds on a weekly, perhaps even a daily basis to their marketing agents, providing a very secure and resilient source of income. A rural woman play a strong role in poultry production. And uh, it's, as is clear for everybody, poultry plays an important role in adding valuable protein to rural diets. So here is a very important figure that I, I wanted to show you. This is the, the food loss profile that we have set up from the Kenyan poultry sector. And as you can see here at the bottom, we've looked at two different uh, types of, of poultry, uh, let's say supply chains, the ones where birds are sold in a live state, transported and sold in a live state. This accounts to approximately 85% of the total volume of sales of poultry in Kenya, and only 15% of the sales are birds that are sold slaughtered. What we see mostly is that the live birds are indigenous chickens, while the slaughtered birds are broilers and other uh, types of chicken production systems. In the indigenous chickens, you can see 13% of the chickens that leave the farm gate do not reach the end consumers, end consumers, sorry. Uh, and all of this occurs in the transport. So because there is no regulation on transport and the way animals need to be transported over long distance, uh, a number, these 13% of animals actually uh, do not reach the market point alive. Uh, in the case of, let's say, the slaughtered chicken products, there is quite a difference. Um, uh, in transport, we also see losses, but it's also only 4%, uh, often due to non-functional cooling in transport. And in, in the slaughter, we see also some losses, but this is often related to non-edible food products. What I want to make very clear in this slide is that if you actually want to target food losses in the poultry sector, the best bet would be to target these losses in transport of live animals, and you would thus be focusing on the indigenous poultry produ producers. Uh, so there are many technologies, some of them are, are, are uh, let's say, not even so high tech uh, uh, cages and, and uh, let's say, uh, correct transportation devices are not very high tech technologies. Obviously, we have slaughtering facilities and other type of, let's say, rendering facilities that are more high tech. But what is important is that there are technologies out there to support the poultry sector, but that the emphasis must move beyond production and productivity, also looking into other factors of the, the chain and the sector uh, as a whole. And very important from our perspective is to adjust these technologies to the context and to the applicable design in order to form a, a viable business opportunity that is locally feasible. Uh, I've mentioned this before, uh, I, I think it's, it's not of any value to only look at food loss reduction, uh, what is actually needed in the Kenyan poultry sector is integrated sector transformation that goes from feed inputs uh, production up to post harvest value addition and uh, marketing and consumption. Uh, uh, but that's a whole different topic in itself. I, I see a huge potential for digital solutions. And I mentioned this here as a leverage point and not as a business opportunity. Digital solutions that could offer through blockchain, traceability, fair pricing, market information, market access, and uh, even agri-finance innovations have huge potential to take the Kenyan poultry sector to a next level. Nevertheless, the big question here is who is willing to invest? 
who is willing to put in those additional resources. Okay, I'm trying to go a little bit faster here uh, in terms of time. I only have a couple of slides left. What I'm showing you here are actually some of the areas where we feel that uh, interventions are required in order to support the Kenyan uh, poultry sector. Uh, I've spoken about some of these, so the improved transportation of live birds, which uh, mid-tech cooling solutions for those birds that are slaughtered and transported, uh, which is a lower number, but it's still important. I've, uh, all of these type of solutions need supportive incentives and regulations, both from the private sector as the public sector. Um, I feel that for uh, uh, the indigenous and let's say the more industrial poultry players, traceability and market linkage is a key, key intervention that could support the sector, both in terms of quality of the produce, safety of the produce, but also in improving the market linkage. Uh, and then really thinking of those handful of industrial players, high tech slaughtering facilities could also be a viable business opportunity as well as waste rendering facilities. Now, what we've seen with these two last ones, the high tech slaughtering facilities and the waste rendering facilities is that they are only feasible business opportunities with very, very large volumes of birds. Uh, and uh, at the moment, this is only the case for very limited number of stakeholders, actors and regional locations in Kenya. Um, so uh, very briefly, these are <laughs> the last three slides. Uh, some of the business opportunities, really thinking of, of business interventions, business, uh, let's say, uh, 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 yeah, business opportunities to reduce losses in the Kenyan poultry sector. We've coined two slaughtering facilities and rendering facilities, and then looked at different levels and scales uh, because of the diversity of the Kenyan poultry sector. We do not believe that the, let's say, the industrial scale that is managed in the Netherlands is feasible within Kenya. So. Uh, key is stakeholder collaboration and market integration, so horizontal integration of producers and vertical integration with other uh, sector stakeholders. Um, and then for the slaughtering facilities, we've looked at small and medium scale slaughtering facilities in contrast to large scale. Uh, what we see here is that for Dutch investors and Dutch, let's say, uh, companies interested in investing in the Kenyan sector, that uh, there's still a relative mismatch in terms of number and intensity. So that's the importance of tailoring technologies uh, to the Kenyan context. Uh, but as we coin here, there are options for these type of slaughtering facilities, but they must be really tailored to uh, site-specific interventions. The same goes for rendering facilities, which transform food losses and, and poultry waste into uh, a high value uh, uh, um, livestock feed products. Uh, again, we've looked at medium scale and industrial scale. We know that there are a couple of large scale industry players in Kenya looking into these options uh, and they seem to have a viable market and it would be interesting also as they would play into the current uh, uh, raise of, 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 of prices in uh, protein of animal feed. Uh, two slides on reflections, I hope time permits, but the first one is, as mentioned, is just coming back. Losses are highest in the domestic sector, which is dominated by small scale farmer and cottage industries. Nevertheless, this is not the typical environment for Dutch sophisticated large scale companies to operate. So I'm curious to hear from you, perhaps the audience that is listening, uh, how you see uh, support coming towards this industry. How do you foresee? I'd, I'd love to hear your reflections as, as well on, on this topic. Uh, as mentioned, there are many different technology options, but uh, they are currently not very interesting for the informal market. So how can we transform these technology options and make them more interesting for this indigenous informal poultry sector? Uh, and one of the ones that I was thinking about is this digital innovations that I've mentioned at the, in, the, in previous slides. 
What we believe in conclusion, and I promise you this is the last one, <laughs> is that loss reduction of 50% is possible in the un informal domestic supply chain. So if you recall, we coined 15% losses at the moment. We feel that this could be reduced to 7% easily without too heavy, heavy investments by improving handling and transportation of live animals. But the big question is who is going to invest in that? Is that the producer? Is that the marketing agent? Is that uh, the public sector? Is it a purchasing company? And this is where this, the public-private partnerships are very important and integrated sector approaches are required in order to, uh, to actually uh, I'm sorry, Herman, uh, your sound is off. It's gone. No, it's uh, still gone. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, of course, with uh, such events, uh, technical issues uh, may occur. I think we have done it quite well so far. Uh, let's uh, wait a couple of moments, uh, whether Herman can uh, get uh, his voice back. Am I back? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes thank you. Herman. Yes. Well, I think it was a, a technological glitch that actually helped me get very fast through my last slide. So <laughs> let's leave it at that for now. Thank you so much, Herman, for this extensive and very insightful uh, presentation uh, of the study. Uh, I actually have a couple of questions for you uh, that came in uh, via the chat, so I hope uh, you can help uh, us uh, answer them. Uh, first question uh, comes from Dr. Subiri Obvogo, uh, founder of Kenya, Kenya. I hope I pronounced it uh, right. Um, he says, diseases are a major cause of food loss in poultry smallholder value chains. How does that fit in your framework? Um, yeah, very good point. What, uh, in essence, I did not mention diseases because they come into uh, production losses and, and uh, what our assignment focused on was losses that are incurred into, uh, losses incurred from the farm gate. So from the moment that the poultry leaves the farm gate up to the point where they reach the wholesaler. So I fully agree with you. Diseases are a major impact into the production stage. But uh, unfortunately, in our study, we did not coin these as food losses per se, uh, because they are production losses. It's just a question of definition. Uh, you are fully in the right track. You are, I, I fully agree with you, however. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the answer. And uh, other question here from uh, Witz uh, Felema. Uh, would on-farm mortality not also constitute a food loss? Do we have data on this? Yeah, it, it's, it's a very similar response to the previous question. I fully agree there's a lot of on-farm mortality. And nevertheless, again, these are production losses and not food losses within our conceptual definition. Thank you. I hope this uh, answers uh, the question. Uh, I, I myself also have a, actually a question, but uh, uh, did you also look at the possibilities of uh, circular economy or its role uh, in order to um, yeah, reduce uh, any kind of loss? Um, yeah, I think that's a, a great question. And so we don't, the way that we've looked at, at the potential of circular economy is not so much to reduce losses, but to upscale uh, some of the losses that are already naturally occurring in the poultry sector. So in slaughtering uh, animals and, and processing them, uh, a number of poultry products uh, that are considered inedible uh, remain and are considered waste. And the rendering facility that I mentioned uh, is actually one of these technological options to make use of this poultry waste through circularity and uh, transform it into high value animal protein or animal fodder 
food products. Uh, so in essence, the circularity is using this food waste to through a transformation process in order to produce, uh, let's say, high value food products for animals, for livestock. Uh, and that's, that's the focus we had on circularity. I've not had the opportunity in this presentation to really delve into that too much in detail. Uh, but as mentioned, we are aware that there's a number of large scale industrial Kenyan players looking into that option as they feel that that's a very, very interesting uh, business opportunity to make use of these food losses from an economic perspective. Thank you so much uh, for, uh, for this uh, extensive answer. Um, I see a, a remark here from Thomas Caldia that I'm, I would like to read to you. I'm not sure whether you have any uh, reactions to that, but that just there is shortage of live chicken crates to improve on transport and reduce loss, losses. I, I, I didn't catch the first uh, phrase that you said. Uh, there is a shortage of live chicken crates to improve on transport and reduce losses. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, no, I, I definitely think there is a shortage of these crates. Uh, uh, it, it, it comes again back to the question I had. I, I, there's a shortage of these crates in Kenya, agreed. Nevertheless, I, I can name and list a number of providers of these crates. What I think is that what is currently occurring is that there is no incentive within the sector to use these crates and the awareness of the economic impact of the losses is not felt by all the stakeholders in the chain equally. Uh, so even though we have the technology out there, these crates will have very significant effects to reduce losses during transport. They, we, uh, we know and have experience uh, worldwide on how these crates actually reduce losses, but there is no need uh, incentive requirement to invest in these crates at the moment. So either it's a business model that could do this, or you need more strict enforcement of rules and regulations that would actually set certain policies on how birds should be transported. Uh, but again, uh, from a systems perspective, what you could get then is that certain smallholders are excluded because they are just not willing and, and, and able to make these investments in these type of technologies. Thank you very much. Um, with this, I would like to close this session. Uh, we are actually right on time to go on with the second one. But uh, Herman, again, thank you so much for uh, being present and uh, presenting your uh, study on uh, food systems uh, in Kenya. Uh, I uh, see a lot of chat uh, compliments. I hope you can read them yourselves as well, because uh, uh, if I understand it, it, uh, it has been quite insightful. Uh, just a practical question, uh, practical remark uh, to, to the audience. We are receiving a lot of questions via the Q&A uh, and also via the chat uh, uh, due to the high amount. Uh, we're sorry, but we are not able to uh, answer everything right now. But don't worry, we are uh, uh, saving these uh, questions. And um, uh, after the webinar, we will, uh, we will try to uh, forward it to all the speakers. And once we have an answer, then uh, uh, get it back to you personally. Um, nevertheless, we uh, try, uh, we'll do our best. 